Hey, Seven. Hello. Thank you so much for uh, for coming on the show today. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, interested in seeing what you guys are doing at, at Orchid, and, and you have a really interesting background as well, which I'm excited to talk about. Uh, first, I think it makes sense to get started. You have a pretty interesting nickname, Seven, like the number. Uh, you know, your, your born name is Steve. Uh-huh. I'd be curious to know how you uh, came to be known as Seven. Yeah, sure. It just came up as a nickname in the crypto community. Um, just Steven dropped T. Um, and, uh, you know, since, uh, since addresses in crypto are uh, alphanumeric, I figured just having a, uh, a single number as a nickname was kind of fun. Um, so, yeah, pretty, pretty simple one. It's pretty cool. Uh, Makes for very short email addresses. Literally, the, literally the, num- the, num- the number seven at orchid.com, and that's it. So. That's, that's a nice perk as well. Uh, so I, I want to start back in your earlier days. Uh, you went to Cambridge. Uh, ultimately left with a PhD in speech recognition, uh, an interesting field, uh, obviously, you know, separate from crypto where you are now. Uh, be curious to hear about your experience there and uh, maybe what got you into speech recognition. And that seems like it was kind of a little ahead of its time uh, in that field. So I uh, would love to hear the story there. Yeah, so the big irony there, of course, is that uh, with my accent, um, none of the speech recognition systems actually understand me, whether they're for British English or American English. So um, there's a, a somewhat of an irony that I end up putting on a, a fake accent when I want to get understood by Siri or other things. Uh, but yeah, in the uh, in the early 90s, I started working in um, speech recognition using what today is called deep learning, uh, so neural networks. Um, and generally did a lot of research in the field of machine learning using a, a, a new algorithm um, that had just come out, uh, which I adapted for um, doing faster adaptation of speech recognition uh, and um, yeah, working on a, a deep learning architecture that had been developed at Cambridge and trying to improve the uh, training speeds, which was one of the biggest challenges we were facing back then. But we were working on large vocabulary speech recognition, which is you know, really today what we understand as speech recognition. Um, and each year, the uh, amount of words that we were trying to recognize was going up, the vocabulary was increasing, the kind of environments and noise conditions uh, were getting harder. And you know, a lot of that technology has um, really sort of algorithms have stayed roughly similar to, to what they were back then. Um, but the big advantage now in speech recognition, of course, is that our computing capabilities, whether it's on uh, small phones like we're using today or, um, or servers have uh, just increased enormously. So um, I did some work when I first moved out to the West Coast for a summer uh, in 95 uh, with a company that was doing speech recognition, a little startup. And then um, when I moved out in 97 uh, full time, uh, kind of moved away from speech recognition, moved into more generalized uh, machine learning and deep learning uh, we had a little consulting firm uh, back then uh, working for guys like NASA um, and then eventually uh, moved into working with a lot of internet companies like eBay and Yahoo and Craigslist uh, back in the early days, um, helping them with things like personalization and uh, analytics on their, on their data. What were you doing with those sorts of companies like specifically like NASA or Google? NASA, we had just the most amazing projects uh, we were working on. We had one project where we were modeling uh, space junk. So whenever there's a a rocket goes up, they leave bits behind, or if a satellite crashes into something, it it blows up, and this stuff uh, just sits around in the atmosphere, and there are all these crazy pieces of space junk sitting around, and modeling these things with uh, kind of deterministic equations can become incredibly complicated. Um, so we were doing uh, techniques based on machine learning approaches to to do it in a more probabilistic method, I guess, as we're thinking about it, um, and uh, enable it to be um, done at a much faster scale. Uh, we also built some technology around wind tunnel mo- wind tunnel modeling. So when you get a aircraft and you want to put it in a wind tunnel to try and figure out what the um, what the new aircraft's going to look like when it flies. Um, there are, the cost of doing that is very expensive. And so one of the things we worked on was looking at the profile of the aircraft and the, the, the changes that have been made and doing predictions uh, to what it looked like the aircraft was gonna fly like in the future uh, and thus reducing costs for these guys. And lots of other interesting projects. Uh, we were, 
Um, we weren't venture funded. We were essentially funded using uh, government research grants and NASA consulting projects. And then we were able to use that to uh, segue into potentially bootstrapping funding ourselves um, to develop kind of like internet relevant machine learning tech. Uh, somewhat ironic in that uh, uh, the early work I did in that space, which was quite similar to what became Google AdWords, um, some startups we were working on back then in that group, um, was a lot about personalization and tracking of data. And then many years later, I'm working in a space which is uh, kind of against that. Yeah, so it sounds like you've gone from kind of helping companies like Google with some of the personalization and, and data tracking to enable that. And now you're uh, on the other side with Orchid, uh, helping people protect their information and um, you know, keep companies from leveraging the data to, uh, you know, whether it's sensor surveil or just take advantage via ad campaigns or things like that. I never tried to admit that I have a particular career because I feel like careers are things you have in, like, as, as a, in uh, being an entrepreneur, I figure you just, that's your career, you're always trying to find something interesting to do and something you feel passionate about. Uh, after the, the sort of deep learning machine learning startup, I ended up running security security and analytics um, for a, a dot-com company and got really um, exposed to the kind of field of, of hacking and uh, just understanding how at risk uh, all of our personal data was and subsequently um, was running engineering for a startup working on decentralized technologies back in the early 2000s. Uh, we worked on decentralized search technologies and then we were acquired by Sun Microsystems and then I built out uh, with the team that was already there, the, the open source project that Sun was running um, for peer-to-peer -peer networking. And this was really kind of decentralized systems before cryptocurrencies. So you were kind of surrounded with this early, you know, pre-crypto peer-to-peer technology. Uh, at some point, you know, we're talking, it sounds like late 1990s um, and then early 2000s. At some point in the early 2010s, I think, like 2012, 2013, uh, you discovered Bitcoin for the first time. Uh, can you tell us the story of how you came across that? Yeah, so like I said, it, my career has been bouncing around a few different things. Um, since 2013, I've been exclusively focused on cryptocurrencies, initially Bitcoin. Uh, the story of that one to get there was uh, a little convoluted um my own incubator and different uh different startup ideas to really trying to start my own thing from scratch um and to kind of pay the bills i ended up consulting um and then starting a company uh in the intellectual property space uh fighting patent trolls uh this is a company called rpx so we started that in 2008 and you know, kind of like uh in august 2008 i think we received our first round of funding from Kleiner perkins and then the world had changed, right? Um, and in uh, 2011, we took the company public. Um, 2012, started a, a fund focused on intellectual property and then ended up at Fortress Investment Group, uh, running analytics and uh, CTO for that fund. I quickly decided that I'd had enough of being an intellectual property and wanted to uh, kind of use my skills to, to build things again um, in the startup world. Um, and in chatting with Pete Brigger uh, from Fortress, um, the, he's just inspired me to, you know, perhaps think of think something I could do at Fortress rather than leaving. So I came back a few weeks later after chatting to um, some of my friends, especially some of my friends from the uh, cypherpunk and kind of hacking community, and one of them had suggested Bitcoin. Um, and then to cut a long story short, that digital currency fund of Fortress, which was originally um, Pete Brigger, Mike Novogratz, and then subsequently Dan Moorhead, um, we spun that out into uh, Pantera, um, which in uh, late 2013, uh, we had already got a, a small um, Bitcoin uh, long only fund, because uh, at the time buying Bitcoin was really sketch. It was kind of very hard for people to understand how to do it and which exchanges to use and so on. So we essentially would do that for people in custody. Yet. Um, and then we also started doing investments uh, in companies like Bitstamp and Zappo and Circle and so on in our first venture fund. Uh, we then started another venture fund in 2014 and um, 
then over the next couple of years, I uh, had the privilege of working with many of the really early people in the, in the space, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and then blockchain and uh, smart contracts. Um, and then I, I left in 2016 to pursue my own ideas. And uh, then in 2017, I got together my co-founders and started Orchid. Uh, we, can, we can talk about that one also. Sure. So let's walk through that uh, slowly a little bit. And I appreciate the background. But so 2012, 2013, uh, when you guys, when you, when you discover Bitcoin and you spin out from Fortress uh, with this venture fund and then the second venture fund, um, you know, in those days, correct me if I'm wrong, Bitcoin was, you know, double digit, low triple digit prices. And now it's obviously five digits. So that's well ahead of the curve. Um, you know, early days, you launched in 2009, 2010. Uh, you guys at that time and for a while were the largest fund holding Bitcoin, I understand, uh, and one of the largest holders of Bitcoin overall, um, you know, including non-funds, including individuals who were um, early in the game. Uh, what was your guys' role at that time in uh, kind of the growth? Obviously, you're investing in these Bitcoin-related startups as well. Did you guys view yourselves as having some responsibility for the kind of mass adoption of this technology? Yeah, so in, in those early days, um, I, I, if, you can, if you compare it to today, I think that the question that uh, I realize has, is not so much a question for, um, for most people is, is this Bitcoin thing gonna stick around? Is it, is it for real? And now the arguments are more kind of, um, still around, is this thing worth something? And we can talk about that, of course. Uh, what, what is anything really worth? Um, and, and then it's a it's question of, is this thing going to get used and how is it going to get used? And a lot of those questions are starting to get answered um, more and more. Um, I, I, I don't know about essentially like a sense of responsibility. Um, I, I guess I always feel a, a sense of ownership and responsibility of anything I'm, I'm focused on. Um, and it was just a very wild time. We, when we started the fund at Fortress and then began spinning it out into Pantera, the Mount Gox, uh, actually, you know, the Silk Road, for example, first was uh, seized. And that was quite a shock to things, but in a sense, it also was a, a kind of cleaning up of the space um, because there was a lot of Bitcoin <laughs> moving around because of the Silk Road. And then uh, Mount Gox hack happened in early 2014. Uh, I was on the board of Bitstamp um, at that point, and we quickly became the, the largest uh, fund, the largest uh, uh, exchange in the world. And then subsequently, in uh, you know, kind of like a year or so later, we were subject to, to, an, to a hack, and we had to take the entire system offline and bring it back up online. So there was definitely a sense of responsibility of there were moments where the entire Bitcoin ecosystem could have collapsed. I, I don't think irrevocably, but there was enough issues over a short period of time that you did have the sense of responsibility of if, if we don't get these things right, for example, the, our work with Bitstamp, uh, this whole thing could, could just disappear uh, for at least a period of time. And um, yeah, it was it was it was a, a challenging and definitely an exciting time to to be involved in that. So I I don't want to talk about you know speculate on on price. Um, I think it's it's somewhat silly with any type of near term view. Um, but you mentioned that you know back then people were talking about will this thing survive? Is this thing legit? And now it's more so a question of uh, what is this going to be worth. Um, I still actually, you know, I, I became aware of Bitcoin in 2016, started investing around 2017, around the big uh, spike and then subsequent fall and uh, only have really educated myself and started to really get it within the last um, year or so. Um, and so my question, maybe just because I'm newer to it, is still, is this thing legit and will this thing survive? And I can't really come up with too many scenarios that point to a no. 
uh, based on, you know, all the research and diligence I've done and, and experts who I've heard from. Uh, do you see any situation in which it could, you know, not just drop in value, but really be severely compromised? Um, and if so, what do those situations or scenarios look like? Uh, yes, a great question. Um, I, I, I wish I knew. <laughs> uh, I, good, I think... good point. I was just going to say, um, you know, part of it is I think if there is something that's going to lead to its demise, uh, it seems that no one knows what that would be. Um, it's going to be something that, that is either unpredicted or predicted by a few very quiet mm -hmm. voices, but none of the people who are really in the space. Yeah, I think um, I think the, the the conversation around Bitcoin has moved in a lot of directions. When we first got into it, our perspective was this is digital gold, and so you hold it. And but at the time, people were looking at us, okay, this is a digital currency. Like, like how can we use it for uh, the things you use currencies for? Like, you pay for things, you buy your Starbucks coffee, you do this, do that, and you move it around really fast and. So there's a lot of focus on how do we make this faster? And subsequently, we've seen development of things like Lightning and off-chain solutions to help with that. Uh, but at the same time, we've seen other technologies in the more generalized blockchain space, whether it's with other chains, whether it's with uh, smart contract technologies that have changed the conversation around from can we move this thing around fast to, well, maybe Bitcoin is just digital gold and everything else has its own purpose that will be that, that we will see how it works. So you're almost like designing different chains and different architectures for specific purposes. And to that point, we're starting to see, for example, in the gaming communities, we're seeing different blockchains being developed for NFTs, uh, for in-game assets. And you could do that on Bitcoin, but it's it's people. The attention has moved to other kinds of architectures. And also, I don't think that even back then in the, the early days, we didn't really feel like it was a case for Bitcoin to necessarily be held on everyone's phone so that it could be used to buy coffee. If you really believe this is digital gold, then why are you spending gold to buy coffee? Because you're assuming this gold is going to go up. Um, so I think it's important to, to think through what your belief system is around an asset and essentially act accordingly. Um, I think that within the general cryptocurrency space, the, um, there are some potential challenges in the future that will depend upon some emerging technologies. I think that the zero knowledge proof space, uh, teams like Starkware in Israel, um, there's, there's some architectures there that have the potential to build extremely fast, uh, private and um, scalable uh, currency technologies and the question is then whether or not people feel there's also a, a reason to hold that value uh, but it's also quite hard I think to challenge Bitcoin's dominance in terms of people's general knowledge on it and if you think through this essentially the the branding and marketing campaign that has not really been done by one individual but by many companies in the space you ask the average person in the street if they've heard of Bitcoin, and they're like, yeah, I've kind of heard of Bitcoin. But you ask them about Ethereum, and they're like, oh, what, what is that? Is that something from Lord of the Rings? And, and yet that, for us, is like, you know, that's, that's the big story at the moment is what's happening with Ethereum and DeFi and so on. You start getting down the list, and you say Polkadot or Tron or like and so on, and you just, you, you've lost people immediately. So you, I think if someone's saying, oh, hey, I've got some savings, and I want to invest in this digital currency thing, they go straight to Bitcoin. And then maybe when they're in Bitcoin, then they go a bit further down the rabbit hole and get into Ethereum. And then maybe you get further and further. And before you know it, the DeFi yield farming. But that takes a long time for most people to even think about that. And it, they're certainly not being adopted by 401k plans or by fund of funds and so on. It's really just let's put some money in Bitcoin. So I think that's, you know, kind of read between the lines as to how I think about this. Uh, I don't really have a prediction around where does Bitcoin go? What's the eventual price? Uh, I think it's digital gold. So that's probably what it will look like over time. Um, 
but you know, if we if Elon finds some gold on an asteroid, then of course all bets are off, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so let's leave it at that. I think that's a great way for people to think about it. That's how I personally think about it, at least from one perspective, is Bitcoin is digital gold, um, and you know people can make their deductions on on what it's worth in their mind from there. Um, as part of Pantera, uh, leading Pantera, you were one of the first investors in Zcash, if not the first institutional money in Zcash, another popular cryptocurrency, uh, similar to Bitcoin, but focused more on privacy. Uh, can you talk about how you came to be invested in that and uh, why it was interesting to you guys? Yeah, uh, that was that was a really fun story. So uh, this is really old school stuff. It's like, you know, OG stories. <laughs> the the funny about, part about that is I remember being invited to speak at the Special Operations Command, SOCOM, which is United States Armed Forces and three-letter agencies. And it was in, uh, I think I'm allowed to talk about this, <laughs> but it, it was in this really random place in Florida and there was tons of security. And I was invited to speak to kind of explain the issues with tracking cryptocurrencies and somewhat trying to put people's minds at, at ease a little bit that this wasn't going to become some crazy thing that uh, lots of dodgy people are going to use and it was sort of the end of the world. Um, so I gave this long lecture on how Bitcoin works and the blockchain and all these kind of things that, that they would need to understand. And then one of the guys at the end said, is there anything we should be concerned about? And I was like, yeah, you really should take a look at this zero knowledge proof technology that's coming out. And you know, that could, that could change things. Um, and I think about, I can't remember the exact timing, but uh, roughly so a year or so later, we were, we were looking around for who's going to work on this kind of technology because uh, we were really fascinated by uh, the, the potential for it. And Naval, uh, Naval Ravikant, uh, pinged me and said that uh, he was helping raise money for Zcash and the, the lead guy was Zuko. Um, who I'd known of from his previous work. And so I started meeting with Zuko on a fairly regular basis and really talking through his vision for how to build this thing, but also how to build it in a way that would also not just get shut down immediately. And if you think through the challenges of building something like this and doing it in a way that there's a team, and you're not anonymous, like the original Satoshi personal team did with Bitcoin, uh, and launching something which has privacy built in um, and convincing people, state governments, regulators, and so on, that this is not the end of the world. It is not the terrible thing that you might imagine it would be, but is actually, as, as Zuko very carefully explains and very eloquently puts out, is that governments should want, for example, to have transactions be private uh, for themselves and for and between like you know one government sending a government of money maybe that needs to be a private transaction maybe internally there's private transactions there's plenty of, of of situations where and the majority of them are where private transactions are needed and are already the norm and are not just where we kind of knee jerk move to which is that oh well if it's private you must be have something to hide and therefore you're doing some bad thing because anyone who has something to hide, hide is bad and yeah, so we ended up being the, the, the first uh, institutional investor into Zcash. We subsequently did follow on rounds and uh, were very excited when they launched and uh, Zuko and I stay in touch. Um, and uh, yeah, we're very excited to see how those guys are still doing. You mentioned Naval made the introduction. Uh, I'm a big fan of his and, and a lot of people are. He has almost a religious type following these days, similar to what you see with uh, a lot of people in the crypto space about the, the space in general. Um, what were his contributions in the early days? You mentioned kind of that, that was somewhat of an OG story. Um, was he behind the scenes coordinating a lot of these uh, early fundraisers? I mean, he's at that time, he wasn't as well known, but he was already a super successful um, entrepreneur and investor and his whole you know, business was helping startups raise money through AngelList. Uh, I imagine he took a similar role with some of the early cryptos. Yeah, it was actually interesting when, when we were raising money for Orchid and Naval was an investor, 
uh, he did remind me that he'd uh, he'd been tweeting about the idea of uh, at the time he called it a Tor coin. You know, some of the architecture for Orchid is inspired by the onion routing aspects of Tor, and uh, was kind of saying, "How come no one's done this before?" And I was like, "I don't know, but we're doing it." Uh, but yeah, you know, in our in our time at Pantera, we overlapped a little bit. So I, I know him. Uh, uh, somewhat well socially also from the San Francisco community. And yeah, he, he also started Metastable, which is um, not so well known, but, but a very successful uh, fund, crypto fund. Um, they went, they were in Zcash, they were in Monero, they were in Ethereum, Bitcoin very early. And he uh, was definitely a very significant influence on people in terms of thinking and of, the, of how to, how to think through the value of these things. I view Metastable and uh, Polychain, which is one of your investors in, in Orchid as well, uh, a couple others as, as some of the leading uh, crypto funds in the space. Um, would you care to talk about any of the others that you've overlapped with over the years and um, you know, what their teams have done uniquely or, or what their strengths of these different funds might have been? Well, obviously, because I was, you know, one of the early venture investors in the space, uh, we certainly didn't have the size of funds that are being commanded nowadays. So a lot of our work was very much seed and we were, we were very scrappy in the, in the way we were doing things because raising a venture fund between 2013 and 16 was, was definitely an uphill battle. Uh, and, uh, but we, you know, we, we had about a $30 million fund also in the venture fund too. Um, the, the thing I think that's been interesting comparing it to traditional venture uh, investors, and we have guys like Sequoia, Andreessen, uh, DFJ uh, as traditional venture funds in our first round. Um, the difference I found, and especially also in comparing it to venture investments that we'd that I've had in, in previous startups is that the challenge that these funds face, I believe, in helping early companies is that the founders and especially the technical founders have such a significant uh, advantage in their understanding of what they're doing than is than is typical in in early stage startups. It's almost like the technology curve is, is moving so fast and they really are the experts uh, in terms of what they're doing in, in, in the founding team. And so the amount of really deep technical expertise that can be, can be brought to bear from the venture fund is, is limited. The other thing I've noticed is that a lot of the venture funds end up acting as a hybrid of venture and hedge fund. And hedge funds will do often like spread their bets across a number of different possible outcomes. Venture funds in the old school startup world in San Francisco and Silicon Valley have been, we make a bet and we just bet on that thing. If there's, if there's a YouTube, we're only in YouTube, we're not in Vimeo and so on. Uh, in the crypto space, it's like, well, maybe we'll invest in this or we'll invest in the competitor and we're not quite sure exactly what's gonna happen. And I think that's, I guess that's typical of something which is just very rapidly emerging and no one's quite sure where it's gonna go. Um, but it does tend to somewhat lead to, I guess, kind of like a hands-off approach by a lot of in investors. It, it's, it ends up being just money um, and then perhaps potentially the brand that goes with that money. Uh, although the brand can be sometimes not always positive when the larger crypto community looks at it and calls you a VC coin or, or something like that. So one of the reasons we brought in uh, teams like Sequoia uh, and uh, DFJ or now, now Threshold and other groups um, was the the advantage that we believed they would give us and the knowledge they would give us as we actually built a product. So once we had the crypto backend, which we do, then when you're taking a VPN product to consumers, what are the lessons and also what are the partnerships that those partners can give you uh, like a Sequoia, could they get you, you know, a partnership with WhatsApp or, or Facebook and so on? Those are the things where we thought there would be a significant advantage uh, that, that we would bring companies like those in. 
So I, I want to get to what we're talking about now with Orchid, your current venture, uh, where you raised from a number of different VCs as, as well as crypto funds. Um, wrapping up your stint with Pantera three or four years, uh, you left, I understand, at some point in 2016. Uh, around that same time, you were the victim of a pretty sophisticated phone hack. Uh, I read you, you wrote a blog about it at the time. Um, and I don't know how much you were thinking about it then, but sort of predicted your own uh, entry into the privacy world and creating something to help things like this hopefully not happen to other people to have their privacy invaded. And basically with Orchid, you wanted to um, end censorship and, and surveillance on the internet uh, and return it kind of to its original values about access uh, and, and privacy. Uh, with the belief that kind of everyone should have free and, and unsurveilled and uncensored access to information worldwide uh, and, and the ability to share that. Could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, that transition period from leaving Pantera to having that hack and then starting Orchid? Yeah, so after I left Pantera, I was, I was perfectly honestly just a little sad about cryptocurrencies and blockchain in general. Uh, this was before the you know, token wave and the ICOs, this was a year before that. And I started looking really carefully at security, surveillance, censorship. Uh, I was starting to become very concerned about just macro trends I saw in that area and things like how messaging applications were ultimately centralized and if they were subject to government coercion, what would that mean? The general issues around uh, the, the large scale gathering of data and usage of it by large internet portals. So I just had a I had very much like a concern. I started thinking about uh, building a, building almost like a think tank, a bit like OpenAI, if you're familiar with that, Elon Musk's and, and uh, others, Sam Altman's work yeah. on building open source AI technologies. And I was like, well, maybe we could do the same thing for security. Maybe we could press the reset button and try and build operating systems and application platforms where security and privacy are built in by default, not as a afterthought. And if you look back in time, you, the, the development of HTTP was first, and then as an afterthought, we put in SSL and uh, encrypted communications. But um, I was really working quite, quite seriously on that and also consulting still in the blockchain space. And then I think it was in October 2016, I got a strange message on my phone and then a phone call from somebody asking me a question that they said they were writing a blog and I, and I wrote about this in my Medium article. And the, the, the question seemed innocuous, but I realized that it was a security, like a, one of those stupid private questions that you're supposed to put into something. Um, and then I got a call from Verizon asking me if I wanted to port my phone number. And I was like, no, someone's trying to hack me. You need to lock everything up right now. And you know, no offense to Verizon, because this has actually been a, 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 across all of these uh, different carriers. They've all had issues. So I put in controls on Verizon and so on, woke up the next morning, and everything had been ported. <laughs> And, and so I said that I was like, oh, that's okay. Cause I have two FA and I have all these things. And then I realized that I left one thing open um, in when I was doing some, uh, some administration on one of my websites and there was essentially a, a hole in my architecture. So they were in my email accounts and then they were trying to two FA into crypto accounts and kind of all the things that anyone who's been studied this kind of attack uh, once you have control of a phone number, there's a lot of things you can do uh, to people. Um, and just for the excited uh, hackers out there, my architecture is, is significantly improved and, and different now. And I'm not gonna put that as a challenge, but um, I, uh, I definitely take care of things in a different way now. But um, it really woke me up. It really woke me up to the idea that, not specifically that, hey, I need to start an anti phone porting company, although I looked quite carefully into that idea and some other people have been working on that. But it really put me down a rabbit hole of 
Uh, sometimes as a venture investor, you can spend a lot of time thinking about lots of different things that could be done. And until somebody comes along with something, you, you don't have the courage or convictions. But as an entrepreneur, you need to just be motivated and perhaps motivated by an extrinsic source. And that really was it for me. The search through ideas around privacy um, as it related to phone networks led me into thinking about uh, VPN technology and, and how that worked and the market for that, which I hadn't studied significantly up until that point and really noticed that it was a very fragmented space and uh, there was a lot of issues with who do you trust? Can you trust VPNs? I talked to friends of mine running engineering at different VPN companies who explained that the business model for many VPN companies was to actually sell your data in an aggregated format, which any aggregated format can be reduced down to single information if you're smart enough. And then uh, chatting actually to the, the inspiration for building the sort of incentivized tokenized network was thinking this through from a perspective of if you're going to do VPNs, then why don't you do onion routing and layered networks also? And then instead of it being volunteer based, like the traditional onion, onion routing networks, maybe you incentivize it and conversations with, with Olaf from Polychain were very instrumental in inspiring that idea. Uh, and then I was lucky enough to meet some incredible co-founders, um, Jay Freeman, who'd built out Sadia and the, jailbreaking framework for the iPhone and built the first app store for the iPhone for jailbroken iPhones. Uh, Gustav Simonson, um, who'd been early um, Ethereum core security team. And, uh, and Brian Fox, who was first employed at the Free Software Foundation and wrote Bash, which is on all of our devices now. So that was our initial founding setup. And then we were lucky enough to, to get some amazing support from some, uh, some great partners in Silicon Valley and beyond. And yeah, it's been a it's been a journey ever since. Uh, I was talking to someone the other day, and they said, "Wow, you guys are like really OG because you know you started this thing in 2017." And I was like, "Yeah, I've been doing this in 2013, so I guess I'm really double OG." But it's it is quite different when you see things like Sushi Swap, which gets started in a few days, and then you know, like has half the liquidity of Uniswap in in a month. Uh, building building networking technology, like just what we're doing, in addition to building smart contracts and running all the game theory on how those systems should work is quite challenging. <laughs> Put it that way. It's, it's, it's a, it's a hard labor of love to get those kind of things. Right. Um, and I, I'll layer two smart contract, uh, scaling technology, uh, layer two payments technology runs at data networking speeds, which is quite significantly faster than what most people think of for payment networks. For example, uh, we actually send packets in, we send payments with every single pack that we that comes from the phone and it's received by node providers. So there's been a lot of very interesting innovations that uh, we've brought in. Um, yeah, this stuff takes time and to do it right. I think it takes time. So you talked a bit about the formation of the early team uh, and, you know, some of your motivations for creating what you've set out to build with Orchid. Can you just kind of explicitly and, and fundamentally explain what ORCID is and why it's important? Yeah, sure. So we've been trying to build the VPN that you expect and uh, sort of a, a funny tagline, but the, the challenge of the existing VPN architectures is you have to trust a VPN node. You have to trust that whoever your VPN provider is, is doing what they're telling you they're doing. They're actually, making your data private. That's what a, a VPN does. And sorry, and sorry to interrupt, but just maybe define a, a VPN for those who aren't sure. familiar. Yeah, of course. So when you use your phone or your computer connected to the networks that you're used to, whether in the US or something like a Verizon or an Xfinity or um, even like a public access network, like in a Starbucks or, or a conference, or well, if we ever have conferences again, but at a conference you're using a public Wi-Fi. Um, all the traffic that's coming from your device is going through uh, a provider, like a service provider, an internet service provider. And that internet service provider can start figuring out a lot of different things based on your IP address, the, the address of your device that you're using. And there are, for example, data sharing agreements between ISPs um, and uh, 
different government agencies, different uh, data collection groups that are not government, but corporations. And another issue you have is that in many parts of the world, and even in, even in, for example, in US high schools, there are blocking of different kinds of content that you're allowed to see. And one of the most famous examples for this is China, the Great Firewall blocks uh, traffic to a large percentage of internet addresses in the world. Um, for censorship reasons, what the government wants you to read or what doesn't want you to read. Uh, Tiananmen Square, for example, that is not available in anywhere in China, information about that. Or if it is, it, it talks about it as being a peaceful student protest. And with a VPN, you can jump out of that firewalled area and uh, essentially cross the firewall and access content that you otherwise wouldn't be able to. So there are both uh, anti-surveillance issues and anti-censorship issues that you can bring in and just a general concept of privacy. Privacy is a, is a very layered term, but that, that's what you think of as a virtual private network. Uh, what we're doing with ORCID is first of all, um, our application on, it's available on iOS and Android and uh, OS X and with some other platforms that the community is working on. It allows you to pay for your connection using cryptocurrency. So now you no, no longer have to give somebody a credit card and uh, give all your information, your address and so on. You just go get some OXT, our cryptocurrency, and pay for a connection. And so first of all, then the payment part of it is now decentralized, which is we think is a significant advantage. The second thing that it allows us to do is that we're able to have a large number of nodes in the network, in the ORCID network, not just a single VPN company, but potentially many people running those nodes. Uh, in our initial network, which is running today, we have seven different uh, entities. None of, them are, none of them are ORCID. We don't run any infrastructure at all. Um, and they are providing bandwidth and the routing in the network. It's similar to a standard VPN. And in these guys are actually professionally run VPN companies. And then you say, okay, well, how, how do you know that you can trust them? Well, maybe you can't. Maybe you can't trust uh, Orchid, who's the company that's, that's currently managing the list of the nodes that you can send traffic to. Maybe we're doing a bad job of that. Well, okay, now you can set up your own list if you like. You can decide that, you know, I'm going to go run some Orchid nodes and I think I can do this better. Or I've got a bunch of friends running VPN companies in South Korea and we want to build a South Korean version. All our code's open source. Uh, the network is fully decentralized. There are just many different advantages to how we've architected the system to really build not just a consumer focused VPN client, which we have, but also a framework for other people to build those kind of clients and other people to run the VPN and other kinds of applications on the ORCID network. Um, in a more broader sense, where we're working on with the community, and this is really being led very much because it's an open source community, is the idea of if VPN services are one kind of service that you can run in a decentralized way, just like we've gone from finance to decentralized finance, what if we could have a more general framework for decentralized services? And you could imagine decentralized compute services. We are seeing now with Filecoin emerging that are decentralized storage systems being built. Um, so in a more general sense, we're thinking and working on technologies that allow us to move beyond just uh, simple bandwidth services to, to other kinds of idea, all with the basis of an underlying privacy uh, by default. That's great. Uh, so you talk about the importance of people being able to access internet freely, unsurveilled, uncensored. One example that I think will resonate with a lot of people, you mentioned, you know, as simple as high schoolers being able to go on Instagram where their uh, school might not permit them to do that on their server. Um, a more serious example is um, with, you know, with COVID uh, in the early days, there was a doctor in Wuhan who, you know, raised a red flag about, uh, he thought it was like a, a SARS type outbreak uh, and was censored. My understanding is uh, through one of the Chinese companies chat platforms uh, from being able to kind of distribute that message across China and around the world. Uh, and do you have any thoughts basically on, you know, a situation like that to me is 
like a great use case for describing why it's so important that people should be able to share information, even if it's wrong. Um, which, you know, you could argue if you try to take the positive side of things that China just didn't want to scare people or, or whatever it might have been. But, um, and I'm not saying that was the, the reason for the censorship, yeah. but even if it was innocent, people deserve to be able to get their message out because it could be, uh, you know, in this case, save hundreds of thousands of lives. Yeah, I agreed. And, and the, the whole what is fake news and what is dangerous is a, is a separate, uh, separate rabbit hole we, we, we can talk about sometime. But the, that particular case, and rather sadly, that doctor died of COVID uh, like a month or so after that whole situation started. Uh, he was censored uh, on a WeChat group. He was disciplined and questioned by police. Um, and yeah, that was actually in early December of last year. So if that information had been more widely available, even if it was necessary, even if like there was a different universe where that was a scare thing and didn't really exist, then that had, we, we had the kind of right to, to know that this was a global issue eventually that uh, has really changed life globally, probably semi-permanently and mostly permanently for a lot of things. Um, and I think that, that particular issue and, and subsequent issues that have come around because of COVID, uh, for example, track and trace and digital contactless tracing and um, the sort of overreach now of governments into people's lives. Uh, there was a case of a, a guy in South Korea who they were tracking uh, people based on uh, geolocations of their phones and he got called out because he was in some dodgy part of, of Seoul and publicly shamed for visiting um, in like a karaoke bar or something. And, uh, and it turned out to be actually an error in the geolocation data, but this guy's life was ruined for a short period of time. It is this kind of, uh, you often see this in, in these crises moments, uh, with this national security crisis or pandemics as we're seeing now, where there's a there's an, a strong overreach of government into people's lives uh, from a perspective of surveillance and a loss of privacy, that my concern is is that it's very hard to unwind that over time. Um, examples of the Patriot Act, which just recently got bilateral support again, and another revision has been approved, and we are 19 years after 9/11, and yet. Uh, this act, which has very wide ranging and strong sort of intrusive reach into people's lives um, is still there and still, still getting approved. What, what about the, the laws that might get put in place for COVID and the technologies that get put in Google or Android phones that, that allow people to, to understand even more about your behavior than they already do, which is enormous. So I think that's my concern as to what does life look like? Uh, I'm not going to say in a post COVID world, but but in five years time, what do things look like uh, beyond this? Right, that's, a, that's an interesting perspective. Uh, and speaking of COVID, obviously it's driven uh, a lot of people, you know, the majority of the states at least to companies to be working remotely. Um, last question, then I, I wanna ask you about a, uh, a new development with ORCID, but you guys were, uh, or ORCID I mean was remote prior to the pandemic, I understand. Uh, would love to hear what went into that decision to be remote, if it was just a convenience thing or more strategic than that, and what advantages might have come from being in that position when the whole world is kind of forced unpredictably to follow suit. Yeah, it's... So we've been essentially dis distributed teams since the beginning of the company. Uh, we, we have, and we're about to, to leave an office in San Francisco and certainly given my background of building companies, you know, with offices and in San Francisco, my thought was, well, we'll have this distributed team, but we'll also have a core team of, uh, of developers in San Francisco physically, or like at least they'll be there. We'll like go to the office and we'll have these things going on. 
in the end, over the period of three years that we built in the company, that happened a little bit. We definitely brought in talent from the Bay Area, but because the larger team was all working in a distributed fashion, whereas we would have sort of like war room sessions or sessions where everybody was in one place for like when we launched the company and so on, we were all, a lot of us were like really dug in and we had people coming and visit, visit in the office. When the lockdown started here, we very quickly adapted to just being fully remote and we had to adjust um, in some small way the, the kind of practices we had for working and uh, it, it took a minute to, to get there. But I think we had a, a bit of a head start on many people who were using Zoom for the first time or trying to understand how to use Notion or just, you know, what, how do I run time zones? How do I run my life? And um, I think the mistake a lot of people have made through this period is like in San Francisco, we're still in basically some form of lockdown. Uh, things are not really open. And especially with the incredibly bad fires we've had recently, the streets are empty uh, of traffic, of people. And I think the mistake people are still making is feeling like this is temporary and we're going to go back to normal soon. Uh, like when there's a vaccine or something else happens. I think there's been a fundamental change in society, in work, in education, in having relationships. I think it's just, it's shifted. And it's not just been because of COVID. I think it's been happening for many, many years, but this pandemic lockdowns in different places have accelerated history to the point where uh, our future is going to look very different. Um, it doesn't mean I don't think we'll ever have a conference again where we all meet in person, but I do think there'll be less. I do think there'll be more sparsely attended. I think there maybe will be in the case of conferences, I think there'll be almost like a hybrid online in, in real life combination. Uh, I think things like virtual reality will um, become accelerated in adoption and, and usage. Um, I have a lot of predictions of, of where I think things are going, but uh, assuming things are temporary, I think is, is a very big mistake right now. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I, uh, I wrote a piece towards the beginning of this uh, called Seeing the Future in the Dark about how basically we turn the lights off on the whole world um, and people are going to adapt to that. And, you know, whenever the lights go back on, if, you know, say there's a vaccine and obviously it's not going to be night and day like a lot of people think. Um, but when things do start to return to, you know, more comfortable, more comfortability with meeting in person and things like that, there's all the legacy of, of people having adapted to life in the times of COVID, you know, ordering their groceries online, traveling less, going to the office less. And you can't just take those things back. People can't kind of unsee the changes that they've seen in their lives and the changes that they've made. Um, so I, I totally agree with you that. Um, you know, if there is a return to normal, if you want to call it that, it's going to be a very new normal and a very different uh, way than, you know, 2019 was. Um, last question. Uh, I understand by the time I release uh, this, by the time this conversation is out in public, uh, Orchid's going to have made an announcement. Would love to hear what that is. Uh, I don't know it myself. Um, so would love yeah. to have you talk about that briefly. Yeah, so we're, we're doing uh, an extension to an existing um, collaboration with Chainlink. Uh, Chainlink's a network of decentralized oracles. Um, and what this uh, new capability in is makes it easier for the Orchid application and for users of the network to uh, determine the price of bandwidth on any particular VPN. Um, so we're, uh, we're going to be making, and I think by this point, it will be live, uh, the, the second Oracle that we've created in collaboration with Chainlink and the overall communities in both uh, groups, um, aggregates information from the providers in the Orchid network and gives users a better estimate of the cost of bandwidth. Um, it also uh, acts as a kind of secret shopper, um, which samples bandwidth pricing from different providers in the Orchid network um, and builds this sort of generalized pricing uh, information for the users. So it'll give people um, an easier tool and the applications an easier way to estimate the price of service on the network. So that sounds like it'll help people kind of optimize the price at, w at which they're buying and help drive competition on the VPN side. Is that somewhat accurate? Yeah, and I think that 
over time, you can imagine these kind of oracles to also start to give information, not just around price, but also, you know, uptime availability, those kind of kind of things that you need. And as I was talking about before, we we're, we're really doing a lot of these things in this work and really being driven a lot by ideas with the community and development there to uh, build a, a path to the idea of uh, decentralized services and what does that future look like? And that's, uh, that's really a lot of uh, our thinking process there. That's great. Well, uh, Seven, thank you so much for, for coming on the show today and sharing your perspective. It's a fascinating story and uh, really interested to see what what's, comes of Orchid. Uh, I think it's a really exciting project. Uh, want to give you the last word just to share, um, you know, where people should go to learn more about Orchid, download it, uh, learn more and, and read stuff from you. Um, anything else you want to, you want to leave people with? Sure. Okay. Well, the, all, all the information is found on our website. It's orchid.com. That's O-R-C-H-I-D.com. Just like the flower. Uh, our Twitter is orchid protocol. Uh, my Twitter is D seven troll, which is D E uh, S E V E N T R A L. It's kind of like D central, but with seven in it. And yeah, we'd be happy to hear from you and uh, love to learn more about people's ideas for, for where this can go and uh, help you improve your privacy online. Thank you so much, Drake. 